Professor Leavitt is visiting from uh, Temple University in Philadelphia, and she's visiting uh, the ASC on a mentoring visit sponsored by the Excellence Initiative, uh, EDUB, of the University of Warsaw. So thank you to the sponsors. This has been an amazing uh, visit. So, you know, I, I just want to briefly say how I, how I met Laura. Uh, this was, uh, you know, such a beautiful moment, and and this is really, in fact, related to our common interests um, in American Jewish history, and also our uh, common interest in thinking about the Holocaust. And uh, and I think in this moment, how we met and how we started talking in a hotel lobby late at night, I was very jet lagged. Um, uh, we started talking about the book that I just uh, edited at that point in 2017 and uh, started exchanging thoughts. And this was kind of, you know, a, a thread that uh, has been continuing since then. Um, and I also saw right away that Laura was an amazing mentor, like the approach that she took to a younger scholar was uh, extremely, extremely gracious and just wonderful. Um, I want to say a few things about um, uh, about her work. So Laura comes from uh, Philadelphia, from Temple University, where she is a professor uh, of religion, uh, Jewish studies, and gender studies. These are uh, uh, fields that she relates to each other in an original and innovative way. Um, and I think this will be visible also in this talk. Uh, she is an author of uh, multiple monographs and edited volumes. The ones that I would like to mention in this context, um, the closest one to this talk is American Jewish Loss After the Holocaust from 2007. But her newest book, which is, I would say, a part of kind of the field of thinking about these issues is uh, the book, The Objects That Remained, uh, that was published in 2020. Linking uh, her thinking about Jewish studies and gender studies, she is a co-editor um, co together with Miriam Peskowitz of a uh, incredible and fundamental uh, collection, Judaism Since Gender, that is one of these voices from the 90s that initiated, I think, um, scholarly reflection on how these two fields are related and how they are really necessarily related. So this is 1997. One of the things that uh, I think is also uh, incredible is how Laura curates the field of um, of uh, thinking about religion uh, as an editor of uh, a book series with uh, New York University Press, uh, North American Religions uh, uh, series. So these are just some highlights from her uh, uh, very rich uh, CV. I remember when we were submitting the CV to the Excellence Initiative, this was a big file. Um, and uh, uh, but I, I want to I want to stress this. Uh, there are so many stories that I've heard how uh, Laura was mentoring uh, younger scholars and especially women also within uh, American Association for Jewish Studies. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Laura Leavitt and I'm very much looking forward to her lecture, American Jewish Loss After the Holocaust, an object lesson. Okay. Well, thank you, Carolina. And I want to make sure you all, uh, you can hear me well. It's okay. Um, since I'm doing this from a hotel. Um, so I, it, it is my honor to be here, um, to be here actually physically in, in Warsaw and to be doing this um, talk for the American Studies Program. And I wanna thank, um, I wanna thank the initiative, but I also wanna thank all of the people at the center um, who've made this possible. And so please, I, I really wanna thank you again. So let me just um, say to, to begin with a little bit um, off the, um, the, the script, just to give you a sense of where this, um, this talk is coming from. So I want to articulate um, a shift um, that's perhaps in some ways still um, inchoate um, in the present. I'm speaking of a future that is already coming into being, and that's kind of the conceit of the, the talk. And I'm really talking about a kind of shift in the ways in which um, the Holocaust is remembered and commemorated um, within the United States and particularly among American Jews. So this is where the talk is coming from. And in many ways it um, bridges uh, the book 
I wrote called American Jewish Loss After the Holocaust and my most recent work, The Objects That Remain. So that's, you get the title kind of uses both of those. So I speak to you um, about the future of Holocaust commemoration today, as we find ourselves at a crossroad, at the very precipice where memory and history meet, the very moment when those who have so powerfully told their stories and lived their lives after such horror are coming to the last of their full lives. And although this is true across the globe, what I want to talk about um, today is how the Holocaust has been remembered and commemorated in the United States. I wanna consider what is at stake at this historical crossroad by thinking about the term after, as not just about after the war or after the Shoah, but as memory becomes history. I wanna share with you how the Holocaust has been remembered in the United States in the past and how it might be and how it is becoming remembered and I think becoming is probably more appropriate uh, going forward. Um, I also wanna think about how the loss um, that is the Shoah is experienced and understood in relation to other losses, not as competitive memories, but rather in terms of how different losses touch and what prompts those memories, the people, but also increasingly the objects that occasion these efforts. So let me begin with what is commemoration? Commemoration is, I believe, an invitation. It is addressed to all of us who hope to keep memory meaningful and compelling in an ever-shifting present. So for today, I'm asking you to begin to imagine something a bit different from what um, those of us in the United States have known thus far in um, our efforts to commemorate the Holocaust. Um, and this is that becoming vision that builds on and respects or and respectfully appreciates how indebted we are to all of the work of so many who for so long, who for so long in making the Holocaust or the Shoah a part of our collective memory as Jews and as Americans and as citizens of the world. I really wanna kind of honor those efforts and at the same time, begin to think with you about how we might um, see how that discourse and those practices are shifting. Um, and again, I want to stress how indebted we are to the efforts of so many dedicated people. Um, you know, and again, also even as I'm pushing in a different direction. So to do this, I wanna suggest that we cannot afford to take for granted anything that we have learned thus far. We cannot be content that we already know what it means to never forget. And so I wanna share some thoughts with you about how we might see Holocaust memory as alive a living entity that grows and changes over time, a legacy that is not afraid to confront new generations with new knowledge and insights in the, into this, in, in this horrific past. Insights that come out of an ongoing engagement, theirs, yours, mine, and ours. Some background. My own scholarly work on the Holocaust is part of a longstanding American conversation about Holocaust memory and questions of um, both representation and commemoration. This scholarly conversation does not presume that never forgetting is a foregone conclusion or that the need to remember the Holocaust is itself a self-evident proposition. Instead, in the scholarly tradition, my remarks today are an intervention into the question of how, how to keep Holocaust memory alive for generations increasingly removed from the immediacy of those historic events. By arguing against certain truisms in the commemoration of the Holocaust, like never forget, mine is, as I've said, an invitation into the future of Holocaust memory. I ask how we might keep commemorative and historical sites in the United States, like the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, and gatherings and talks, even like this one, compelling and important to audiences, visitors, and viewers who are and are not the children or the grandchildren of survivors, Jews and non-Jews, citizens of all of our collective humanity, whose precious relationship to these horrific events are increasingly mediated by time as they approach the rich sources and resources, testimonies, histories, films, memoirs, museums, memorials, and so many varied works of imagination that survivors and first generations have made available to all of us. We are their heirs. 
Because I'm concerned about the future of commemoration, I'm especially interested in addressing the vast majority of those who now visit places like the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC, um, including most Jewish visitors who come without such intimate connections to the Holocaust. And towards this end, my remarks today begin by challenging again what I've said are um, a set of ways of engaging. And here are the two things I want you to think about with me. Reverence, assuming a particular position as if there is only one way, one correct way um, to engage with this past. And two, how we are supposed to deal with other losses in relation to the Holocaust. So non-Holocaust related experiences of, um, of loss broadly construed. So let me start with this reverential stance. I want to suggest that there is not only one appropriate way of showing reverence and engaging with this past. Instead, there are a range of honest and meaningful emotions and reactions one can have in commemorating the legacy of the Holocaust. I want to rule nothing out. I don't want to prescribe decorum or present only didactic lessons. In other words, I refuse to assume that there is only one single lesson that one must learn. Rather, I want to imagine a renewed openness to curiosity and critical engagement, including the unexpected insight. The strange, the surprising, and perhaps even the irreverent is important to me because I see these as channels, new ways into the, Holo in, into the Holocaust and into Holocaust memory for new generations who come with fresh eyes and very different orientations in the world, especially those born well after the war and now well after the 20th century. Um, and here I'm thinking of Carolina's work, which I will be workshopping with her and some other scholars um, early next week. What I'm proposing is um, a challenge to the common reverential stance that most American Jews and other Americans have performed and know intimately in relation to Holocaust commemoration as it's been practiced so powerfully in the past. And as a corollary to that stance comes something else that I believe impedes our efforts to keep the memory alive. And that has to do with how American Jews have deferred all other losses to the enormity of the Shoah. And here I wanna talk a little bit more about this. Ordinary losses have been considered insignificant in the face of the Holocaust. And although this was a profoundly well-meaning and significant stance, my argument is that the static nature of this approach precludes a living engagement with the Shoah. It does not allow new generations and people of various and diverse backgrounds to engage with the Holocaust on their own terms. By contrast, I ask us to be mindful of how different losses touch and how the proximity of the pain of others can enable a different kind of commemoration and ongoing engagement. So thus far, the stance we've come to know presumes the following. In places like the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, other losses must pale in comparison and otherwise be deferred. Question, I question this stance precisely because I'm not convinced of its ability to bring others into this particular historical legacy. My concern is with the exclusivity of precisely this well-meaning stance of deferral, its lack of elasticity, and again, its inability to speak or to compel generations further removed uh, from the Shoah to engage as meaningfully as they possibly can, again, with this history. So what does it mean to keep Holocaust memory alive? Such remembrance entails, I believe, a risk, the risk of allowing all kinds of visitors to bring their own ghosts with them to sites of Holocaust commemoration. And they do this not to conflate these memories with the Holocaust and its victims, but rather to let these different losses touch each other. This touching offers a new possibility for keeping the legacy of the Holocaust alive. Touching is key to what I'm calling living memory or what I will explain towards the end of this presentation, an idea of doing justice. A form of commemoration, which is plastic rather than static, as well as very much, as I said, alive. In making this move, I build on the important work of literary scholar Marianne Hirsch and her notion of post-memory. As Hirsch has eloquently explained, post-memory is layered and belated 
like other posts, postmodern, post-war, post-colonial, post-memory, quote, reflects an uneasy oscillation between continuity and rupture. It is not a movement method or idea. Rather, she goes on to argue, it is, quote, a structure of intergenerational and transgenerational return of traumatic knowledge and an embodied experience. It is a consequence of traumatic recall, but unlike post-traumatic stress disorder, it is at a generation removed, unquote. In other words, Hirsch's notion of post-memory points precisely to the mediated and indirect, but still compelling ways that those of us who come after next generations can and do powerfully remember this traumatic past and can even experience it in our own bodies, albeit at least a generation or many, increasingly many generations removed. And like Hirsch, I'm especially moved by the way that artists engage in visual culture and poets and creative writers who use words all help us touch these memories through their art. In my own writing, I've reconsidered how some of the visual works of second and next generation artists like Art Spiegelman and Lori Novak um, exemplify what this touching looks like. Some of you may already know this particular image from Spiegelman's Meta Mouse um, collection. It's, it's um, collected there. And I take, but I take this image um, from the cover of another powerful scholarly work that asks questions about the transmission of Holocaust memory. And this is really literary scholar Michael Rothberg's first book um, called Traumatic Realism. And um, here on the cover of Rothberg's book is Art Spiegelman, the cartoonist, the child of survivors, attempting to capture the complicated ways that he knows his parents' stories or his, their story, the way, mostly through his father, of course, um, the ways that he comes to these tales belatedly and through the mediation of his own craft and imagination as a cartoonist. And here he reminds us, his readers, that he cannot give us direct access to even his own father's story. To write, to draw his opus mouse, he must put on a mask, the mouse mask of his tale. Art Spiegelman uses the figure of the vulnerable mouse to unlock the story, to approach it, to come closer. And yet here he shows us vividly his struggle. And I would say our struggle because for him, mouse, mice, and even rats allow him to get closer into his father's story, but are also overdetermined. As animating drawings, they are haunted by a cultural landscape already filled with ideas about mice including most especially in the American context, and you see this in the background here, Mickey Mouse, whose presence is a reminder of how difficult it is to find a way in. And yet for Spiegel and Mice and comics are all nevertheless serious business. The demand of Holocaust representation for all of us who come after in America is to remember and honor the distance that separates us from those who lived and died in Europe. We must take the effort we must make the effort, even as we acknowledge our own limitations. These two need to be a part of the pictures we draw and the narratives we tell. Um, here, photographic artist Lori Novak, who was born into a Jewish but not a survivor family in America well after the war, uses projections to show us vividly how memory works. In this 1987 work called, entitled Past Lives, Novak makes visible the ways memories are layered, overlapping and interconnected. In this haunting image, we see the faces of children, Jewish children in hiding in France. We see another image, the face of a woman, and then interlaid with these images, we see the artist as a young child held in the arms of her mother, a quintessential mid 20th century American image. Writing about this photograph, Novick explains the context of its production. She writes, it was the time of the trial of Nazi war criminal Klaus Barbie. The floating projected image in past lives is of a group of children hidden in a boarding school in Izu, France, who were then deported by Barbie and sent to their deaths in a concentration camp. Both 
my projected collage, images of Ethel Rosenberg, the children from Izu, and me clutching my mother merge. I become the recipient of the weight of my, culture, my cultural past, unquote. In this way, Novik invites all of us to claim the weight of our various cultural pasts, including the Holocaust. Building on Novak's example, we each take on the legacies of our various um, histories in commemoration. Here, the artist shows us how this often happens. The meaning of the juxtaposed images is neither simple nor set. Each of us brings our own memories and experiences, our personal and collective histories to these encounters. And works like Spiegelman's and Novak's help us appreciate and confront this complicated process. The Tower of Faces, um, this is a much bigger picture. And uh, having been at Pauline today, I feel a little saturated and I'm still trying to kind of think this image compared to so much of what I um, experienced today. So the artistic works I was just talking about um, in particular have helped me understand more fully my own response to Yafa Eilich's photographic memorial, the Tower of Faces um, at the museum in Washington. We appreciate how perhaps an alternative form of remembrance can and does work in relation to this extraordinary memorial, a tower made up of once ordinary objects, family and communal photographs. And as I will now explain the familiarity of these images or these objects, um, they are objects and images, right? Um, and uh, for many American Jews, those whose families who came to the United States from Eastern Europe between 1880 and 1924. Our familiarity with those depicted draws us to the memorial. Inside that tower were flooded, many of us, with all kinds of memories. We're reminded of our own family photographs in their similarity to, and this is important, and their difference from these images. And instead of trying to rid ourselves of some of these connections that are not exclusively Holocaust related, we might, I'm arguing, better be better served to observe how these different legacies overlap and intermingle with the legacies of other times and other places. The energy and power of these layers is itself animating. In other words, in the intermingling that stimulates a desire to want, it, it, that stimulates a desire to want to know more, to probe more deeply, to look more closely, and then in so doing, to keep the legacy of the Holocaust vivid and compelling as we continue to live in an ever-changing present. In order to appreciate how the future may be more fully alive with memory, I wanna share with you just a bit of my own sustained engagement with the Tower of Faces. And this discussion comes from my book, American Jewish Loss After the Holocaust. And then what I'll do from there is um, explain how this experience connects us back to this notion of living memory um, and this time as a kind of liturgical practice. And then I'm gonna conclude uh, my remarks with um, two examples of other objects that enable um, and enact this kind of lively interaction and critical engagement. So this section is called Living Memory, the Tower of Faces and Holocaust Memory. In writing about my return to the museum in American Jewish Loss, I, came, I became aware of the ways in which our engagement with Holocaust monuments, museums, and memorials change over time. So when I revisited um, Eilich's photographic memorial after many years and much writing and thinking, I was struck by how differently I experienced this compelling memorial. I saw things I had not previously seen, while more familiar elements of the memorial became less compelling. As a way of explaining, um, in the book, I talk about um, a kind of analogy to reading. I wrote, like texts we read and reread, our ongoing encounters with monuments and memorials are also not static. We see and experience different things over time. Our interpretations and critical engagements again change, unquote. I then went on to think about this insight in relation to what it meant to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive. So by acknowledging this dynamic, I argued, quote, we need to be open to how even these narratives change over time. And thus I wrote, in other words, as I did in my return to the Tower of Faces and the museum, we continue to learn new things from these encounters. We are forever reminded of the ongoing interplay between remembering and forgetting. In both forgetting and remembering, the past continues to change 
it becomes something, as I said, dynamic. It changes with us. Um, and given this, efforts to commemorate the Holocaust must also remain alive and capable of changing. And it's this dynamic that I now wanna just kind of flag as what I'm calling living memory. Um, and it is, in relation, it is related, I should say, intimately to how many contemporary Jews identify as Jews through our engagement with various Jewish pasts, including the Holocaust, but not only the Holocaust. So for me, there's something both animating and resonant in this notion of living memory. It captures something vital and important about contemporary Jewish life. In part, it is the tension between the past and the present that speaks to me as memory opens up into, again, this shifting present. What it carries forward, the various layers and sediments of other times and other places. What are the traces that texture our contemporary understanding and in turn inform how we live our lives now? Through these engagements with the past, memory is given new life as we saw in Novak's past lives. What I come back to is the analogy and the connection between the process of revisiting and reimagining the past and what I've described um, as a kind of reading practice. This begins to make more sense in a Jewish context when we consider the liturgical practice of reading and rereading sacred texts. And this is true in other um, textual traditions. Um, the liturgical calendar for uh, many different Christian communities functions in a similar way. This reading practice, the return to sacred texts in the liturgical calendar through cycles in the Jewish context of Torah readings or the return to specific liturgies on holidays carry the promise of speaking to us in the present. And here I'm thinking especially of Passover, which we recently celebrated. We are commanded to remember the story of the Exodus on Passover, as well as the stories of the tellings and the retellings of this narrative. Again, even for those of us who are secular Jews, these liturgical reenactments are powerful and compelling because they are both familiar and new. In this way, they too point to what, I call, what I'm calling living memory. Okay, so for me, this is a deeply appealing notion because, and I am a religion scholar, I should say that too, um, because it insists on the importance of the relationship between text, the work of art and object and the reader or viewer. It is an interaction that is both performative and dynamic. The obligation in these liturgical enactments is to interact in the present, not to disconnect all of the layers or not to discount all of the layers and textures that inform our experience in the present. It is never in the context of Passover, um, just about the exodus from Egypt. It is that and so much more. So this is what happens in places I'm like the Tower of Faces. So on my first encounter, I was taken by the familiarity of these images, the men and women of a certain era, their proximity to my own Eastern European Jewish family, our past, our photographs and albums, some of the oldest images or objects that my family has are photographs from this, um, this moment. And then, um, of course, being in that tower and both making that connection and then being reminded of how distant my family images, in fact, were from those depicted here. How fortunate my relatives were not to have been, and, and, and if I was doing this in the United States, I'd say there, but I would say now here, um, since I am speaking from Poland. Um, as I returned to the tower years later, um, I was struck differently by the memory of my initial identification with these photographs and how much I worried as I looked again this time about those whose images were outside my gaze. And for anyone who has read my um, most recent book, I do have a kind of affection for objects. Um, and in the case of photographs, it's both the photograph itself, but it's those depicted. And so I got worried about the people who are way up in the top of the, the tower. So, um, you know, I was worried about those whose images were outside my gaze, and I found myself strangely concerned about those whose pictures make up the far reaches of the tower. And I ended up talking to the photography curator at the museum about the future of this memorial. And um, I should say, as of yet, what I'm going to talk about here has not uh, come to fruition. So I asked if there, and this is now a number of years ago, if there were plans in the works to either move the images around so that no one 
depicted gets lost or goes unseen, or if the museum might someday make all of these photographs available electronically or on a screen. Um, I've been with a lot of screens today at Pauline. In other words, someday might a computer image of the tower allow visitors to touch a screen and learn what we can about each and every one of the photographs that make up this tower. What interests me here is the notion that tradition and memory or texts and memorials can and do become fresh and new as we return to them again and again. So part of the pleasure in these returns, including on such occasions as this, um, uh, are memories of so many other Holocaust talks or commemorations that we have attended or otherwise participated in. It is the sedimentation, the textures and layers of different memories, the poem set of meanings that continue to shift and change as we engage in these practices year after year. And this means paying attention to the new and other voices who come to share in these occasions with us. In this case, what it means for me to share these musings with you here in Poland and um, with those across the globe who might be with us online since I'm not sure who all is there or here or with us. Um, although what were once vivid and compelling engagements again may fade, the promise of living memory is that the interpretations or approaches become more salient. Other approaches or um, uh, interpretations become more salient. So the tower faces might go digital. None of these are fixed or permanent. All are additions to the repertoire. This is not about loss, it's about life. The traces of past engagements inform new ones. The ephemeral qualities of these enactments is what makes them bristle with life. Bringing new eyes to these memories is how we breathe new life into them. For me, this capacity to read the same text differently, to engage with a work of art or other kinds of Holocaust objects in ways that change over time is what makes these activities exciting, compelling, and meaningful. And here I'm thinking of the students who are with us today. What might it mean to you? Because you will see things that I, as an older person, might not see at all because I come from a different time and a different place. And this is what it means, I believe, to keep memory alive. To engage with the past is not to pin it down, but rather to appreciate its animating character. And this is true not only for photographs and works of visual culture, but also with physical objects. And so to conclude my remarks, I want to turn to material objects held in places, um, and really the ones that are held, I, I'm really only looking at the Holocaust Museum in Washington for today. So very far from where these, where so much happened here, um, these are removed from this place um, and that time. Um, so I, I think that um, material objects are um, in part um, how I believe we will be increasingly um, thinking about and engaging with this past. Using uh, the model I've suggested, I again want to turn to the power of not just photographs, but other once ordinary physical objects transformed by violence, Holocaust objects that serve as prompts of memory. And here I build on some of the insights from the objects that remain. In the introduction to the objects that remain, oh, ooh, what happened? I'm missing a slide. Huh. I apologize. Um, there is an image that's missing and I, I, there are two that I don't see here. So I will, um, I'll have to improvise a little bit, but you have now the covers of the two books, which will um, give you at least a sense of where I'm going. So in the introduction to the objects that remain, I wrote about different Holocaust objects. Um, I talked about my, this other book and I'm talked about photographs. Um, I wrote about holding and the ways in which um, many people carry these um, images with them. Um, and as I've done in this um, presentation, I wrote about these attachments in haptic terms, touching images, but I also wanted to end this talk by briefly discussing how clothing and other material objects can be even that much more intimate than photographs, as these are objects that, quote, cover and hold our bodies. We wear these textiles, we live inside them. The longer we inhabit them, the more of us they contain. 
And this is really from the introduction of my book. I go on to say, as the poet Maggie Nelson suggests, millions of traces of our DNA in skin cells, sweat, kiss, blood, saliva, tears, permeate such garments. And as I go on to say, um, I discuss my own shock at seeing for the first time up close an intricate prisoner uniform being mended at the museum's offsite facility. And this is what I wrote. Clothing that is worn day in and day out for long periods of time is also marked in a different way. It is shaped by our bodies. Not only were the, these uniforms worn constantly, but because they were handed out haphazardly, they often did not fit and so were carefully tailored by the very prisoners who wore them, who used whatever was at hand to try to make them fit. The uniform jacket I saw being mended was unusual in its intricate tailoring. It was altered to fit a specific person. The camp uniforms held at the museum in the museum collection are so fragile that careful efforts must be made simply to keep them from disintegrating. And because the bodies of those who inhabited these garments have been missing for so long, in order to preserve them, to keep them from falling apart, each uniform has its own body-shaped hanger. These effigies are custom fit. They are specifically made for each jacket, shirt, or pair of pants. These stuffed mannequin-like hanging figures help take the stress off of fragile seams and frayed panels. The prisoners are gone, but the hangers convey a semblance of their presence. In reverse logic, the bodies beneath the fabric protect the garment, not the other way around. I go on to talk about the power of such objects as, quote, the witnesses to the atrocities performed on those who wore them. They attest the crimes as historical and criminal evidence, offering silent testimony. The aura that emanates from these intimate garments are bound to the haptic, the lives that they touched and held in that time, and I want to say in this place. Um, and this is also the case when we consider other pieces of clothing. And I'm sorry, I don't have this slide. In a late chapter of the book, I offer an extended of um, the objects held in the museum, but begin with a child's green sweater. Um, and I'm gonna make this really my last example, where again, memory is prompted by the tactile, by touch and the intimacy of an object of clothing. This time, not a prisoner uniform, but rather a handmade sweater, the gift of a beloved grandmother that was worn by a young child as she escaped the Nazi onslaught of the ghetto where she was living. This green sweater was worn for 14 months as Christine Karen hid in the sewers of Lvov. And again, it is hard not to think about those who are um, trying to protect their families and their children today in Lvov. And of course, at that time, Lvov was a part of Poland. And as we know, it is now a part of the Ukraine. This object, this green sweater, which is now too fragile to be on display, was delicately packaged and is held in a temperature controlled storage facility to preserve it at the museum. But its story continues to be told online at the museum's Curator's Corner site that includes an interview between Karen and um, Susie Schneider, one of the museum's curators. It is also remembered in the gift shop by Karen as uh, by, by a book by Karen, as well as a knitting pattern kit that now enables visitors to recreate the sweater at home in their own hands by knitting it or re-knitting it. Material objects like family photographs and pieces of clothing help us do justice to this horrific past as objects that were there then and here now or there and here, I'm, I have a, I'm having a little problem about where I am. They help us draw connections between then and now. They may serve as empirical evidence of some of the horrific crimes that were perpetrated, and they may also become empirical evidence in the work of historians. But as survivors age and are no longer with us, these material objects take on even more significance. Despite the fact that they may never go to court, they help us do justice to this past by allowing us, and here I mean quite capaciously all of us, to continue to tell stories, stories marked by the material 
acceptance of these often tainted objects. As such, material objects have increasingly become central figures in recent works of historical fiction about the Shoah. These include works like Janice and Safran Foer's Angel or on a Lost Necklace or a Desk. These little objects like those that were owned, worn, or worked on by those no longer with us take up space and help draw us back to that time and that place. And these stories, the proliferation of tales about objects like Karen's sweater or the photographs that make up the Tower of Faces help us once again, breathe new life into these pasts. And the more stories we tell, the more animate the past becomes. This is the promise of holding such rest repositories of Holocaust objects and how we might do justice to this past and keep these memories alive. We do this work now at a crossroad between what has been a living memory of the Shoah as experienced and told by survivors and an increasingly mediated landscape of history as survivors continue to age and ultimately die. Um, we scramble to touch this past. Although there are video testimonies and even hologramic ghosts among us, the tangible presence of objects that were there then and that are here now will, I believe, grow in importance. Their physicality, their tangible presence matters. Photographs as objects, pieces of clothing like Karen's sweater and that prisoner uniform I saw being mended at the museum's offsite facility will continue to importantly link those of us working and living our lives in the present with those who were there then. But as I've suggested, objects do not speak for themselves. We bring them to life by paying attention to them, by telling stories about them. They become the prompts of memory that occasion the telling of all of these different kinds of stories. And so appreciating the ways narrative, the telling of these stories can and do animate the past offers one way of thinking about the future of Holocaust commemoration. The work of scholars and writers, artists and curators, and what they have to tell us about Holocaust objects, about those who wore them or carry them with them, or those who crafted or otherwise made them are the stuff of many tellings. Objects have much to teach us if we allow ourselves to engage with them. If we bring our own experiences, our knowledges, our talents to these artifacts, and here again, I'm speaking to you, the students who are with us today, they become animate and you are a part of that process. There is no one definitive story to tell. And of course, I'm not a historian. Nevertheless, I wanna stress this point. There is no one definitive story to tell. There are many tales and only through the juxtaposition of these different stories, might we continue to breathe new life into this past and its many stories. And here I wanna thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Laura, for this uh, incredible uh, talk. Uh, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier in your talk about this very freeing um, approach to rituals around memory and commemoration and how, and I'm probably simplifying, but I think your position is that like you do you, right? Like that, that uh, to this, I add, you know, sometimes some people's rituals of memory might be cringe worthy for us, but nevertheless, you say, yes, let, let them do this. And I was thinking about the limits of that approach uh, for the context of, uh, for example, uh, Poland and the clashes between the memory, for example, of the Holocaust, that is the mainstream here in Poland. Um, and the narrative about the Second World War in general in Poland uh, versus obviously, for example, the dominating narratives of Holocaust, for example, among American Jewish community. And I, I know for a fact just how contested the various ways in which these, I mean, maybe not groups because it's more than just two groups, but like how the various practices and narratives and stories that these groups have are uh, mutually exclusive and very often uh, cause tension, right? That it's the wrong way 
to commemorate. It's the wrong thing to commemorate. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, you've been here for a while now. Uh, so I'm wondering, what, what do you think about that? That it's not just about one event that might be commem commemorated in various things, uh, in various ways, but that there is also a competition of what was that event or a series of events and like who gets to commemorate it as well. Right, well, and again, I think part of, um, part of what I'm kind of pushing us to think about is the partial nature of any of the narratives we tell. So all of these are um, partial stories, right? Um, and what happened in that in the juxtaposition? And I hear I'm thinking about the Novak image of uh, the layers. And um, and I can say when I've talked about that image, um, I, I talked to a group of it was an interreligious group um, uh, of primarily uh, Christians and Jews. They, they they were so upset about this. They were so upset that um, uh, that that her image was a part of this this configuration that they. Um, they were they were really they they had a hard time listening to what I had to say because they thought that it was um, uh, they worried about communism of course um, and I think that um, one of the possibilities here is um, to just notice what are the different stories that you bring and so um, as opposed to making them competitive so one has to be the right one and one has to be the wrong one but to shift some to allow space okay. Um, and, and again, they, this may change over time and there may be, of course, at different points, you wanna stress more than one more than the other, obviously, or many others. And I would ask for more as opposed to less. Um, but there, you know, this is risky business is the other thing that I said, right? Um, the, the other place I was thinking about was um, students in the United States when after uh, Schindler's List came out, this became like mandatory and all these school children were taken and they were, they were African-American students who were coming from really, they were coming from inner city um, neighborhoods where there was a lot of violence and they were living with violence and they were being taken to this place to be reverential and some of them laughed, some of them were uncomfortable, but nobody asked them like, why is it you're doing that? Then they were kind of, there was a kind of dismissive thing that they, they weren't being properly um, reverential. But what does it mean to, to live in a world where um, black lives don't matter, right? Um, and, to, and to be in another place where it seems that other lives were important. And so it could have been an opportunity to open up a space for that. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Obviously there's, I think there is always this tension of like, you know, who has the power to let in the other narrative into who gets to move around pieces of the story to allow for the other pieces right and i think this is the tension that it's not an equal playing field but but i think that obviously yeah. you are right and i don't want to dominate this conversation so uh... I, I will just add to this so it's um ethel rosenberg i had rosa luxemburg in my head and ethel rosenberg and i knew i it was they were getting confused in my head um but i think that um one of the things um that I think can happen is um, uh, trying to kind of open up the possibility of some of these other tales. Because the, I've given talks for Yom HaShoah in the United States, and I've actually tried to talk about some of these things. And part of what was painful to me is that these were once, you know, hundreds of people would come to these events and there are fewer and fewer of them coming, right? And there was something extremely painful to me about that. And so in part, I, I wanna say, okay, what is it that could be um, compelling, right? Um, and even people my age, I'm, I'm in my early 60s, people you know, my age uh, who went to Jewish day schools in the United States, people in Jewish studies, you know, don't wanna do Holocaust because it was kind of shoved down their throat in a particular way. And they were told that they're supposed to cry here. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to, to take a pose um, um, in a particular way. And they never got to have any feelings of their own. They never got to experience whatever it is that, that was um, interesting to them. They, they, were, they were told this is the proper stance and you're supposed to have it. And, um, and I really bristle at that because I don't think that is um, an effective way of keeping memory alive. And that's the urgency of my, my willingness to move in that direction. And of course, it is an American um, 
context in which I am making these claims. And I think maybe, you know, this could be one of these areas, and I wrote this down before the talk, is that I wanted to ask all of you. I'm interested in how this account um, is both similar to and different from how these efforts work in Poland, right? I think that is a real thing. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you, Laura, for, um, for this talk. I would like you to pick up on the uh, risky business of uh, kind of, you know, thinking along uh, the lines of multidirectionality. And um, and I was, I'm, I kind of want to talk maybe briefly about Michael Rothberg that, you know, you, you talked about his first book, but uh, it kind of, you know, risky. So uh, Multidirectional memory was published in in Poland in 2016, I believe, in in translation. And I know that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Stanisław Obiłek, who is here, um, uh, Professor Obiłek, who is here or um, uh -huh. here with us, wrote about this briefly. But the the book was not um, there was not no major debate around around the translation. This was a pretty quiet reception of of this book that is a quintessential for memory studies today. On the other hand, uh, the book was published in Germany last year, and there was a storm. The yes, exactly like <laughs> what Laura said. Like uh, the amount of criticism, nastiness, and and and, uh, and frankly, epistemic violence. That was um, uh, that that Michael Michael's uh, book was subjected to was absolutely incredible and it really showed you know how um, how German humanities are not prepared for thinking about race and thinking about colonialism and decolonization. Um, so we have these two con contexts that are very different from the context of the U.S. in thinking about um, uh, the Holocaust and the memory memorialization of the Holocaust. And it's very two very different reactions. Um, but I, I kind of have the feeling that in a like down deep they are they are similar. They are not, you know, neither here in Poland nor in Germany we are able to deal with with that, with what he is suggesting, with multidirectionality and kind of deep down uh, uh, thinking about solidarities really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, in the end, in in um, in American Jewish loss, uh, which came out about the same time that um, uh, multidirectional memory came out in the U.S., um, they I think they were published within a year or, or the same year as each other. I I, I will get this slightly wrong. Um, and in I, about different losses touching, and I work in a more intimate version of this. So I think about individuals and. Um, uh, like uh, familial memory, um, individual memory, traumatic memory of individuals. And I think part of what multidirectional memory was trying to do is to think about post-Holocaust and post-colonial together. And I mean, it is a it is a gorgeous book and it's beautifully constructed um, and eloquent. And I, 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 I'm very, very moved by, by that work. Um, and I think that we do a similar kind of thing, although he does it on a more geo politically um, uh, robust stage. And I wonder if, um, if, a more, if, if the more intimate account might actually um, uh, offer a way that's less charged perhaps in some of these other settings, I don't know. Um, but I think that that's something that I think would be worth considering. Um, on the other hand, I think, you know, being able to do this work in a comparative way and to think about different reception history, I think is very useful because his examples in multidirectional memory are French. So um, what does it mean to think about these French examples, um, which is what he's really doing? Um, and the, the survivors, um, Delbo, who was involved in some of those efforts. I mean, these are gorgeous intertextual moves that he's making, um, but in a very specific context. So that is less charged for Americans because we have our own stuff that we haven't worked through, uh, which uh, I think is also deserving of some more attention, right? Um, so thinking about indigenous people's black lives, which I- uh, Professor Obirak, please go ahead. Uh, 
nice to see you again, Laura. It was a brief meeting in Pauline. And now uh, I would like to perhaps uh, follow um, Mark Rothberg's uh, uh, next step, uh, namely implicated subject. I think multiply um, multidirectional memory is quite uh, uh, neutral. You can take together different perspectives, you enrich your view with others. So it's uh, in Poland was really, Karolina is right, it was not discussed, but it was received as, as uh, important uh, contribution to uh, include also our Polish perspective into discussion on Holocaust. But implicated subject, I already discussed this book with my students and I saw a very strong resistance to be seen almost as implicated in uh, events in which we, as a Pole, we never took part. Uh, so uh, my question is uh, how you uh, evaluate this uh, next step in uh, Mark Rothberg uh, reflection on the memory and uh, res reflecting on the Holocaust as, as, as universal in a way uh, event uh, for humanity. Yeah, I'm not sure he would use universal exactly, but I, 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 but I think this idea that that it, it can occasion some of these kind of interactions. So like, um, you know, I, I, and I'll be say something somewhat controversial here and then I'll come back to Rothberg, but um, I think that like the Shoah Foundation, incredibly well-meaning and incredibly powerful um, has kind of gone global, right? Um, and so it has um, come up with this idea of video testimony and it has a script and it has an idea of how this worked in this particular, case in, in relation to the Holocaust. Um, and part of there are in growing efforts, and this is something that Noah Schenker, among others, is, is thinking critically about, not just the holograms, but, but the, this question of the, the sort of framework of those video testimonies applying to um, other genocides in other cultural contexts. And I, 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 again, I think it's coming from an incredibly well-meaning place, but I also think it, it, um, it presumes a kind of universality of um, a certain, uh, of a certain kind of um, uh, testimonial set of practices. Um, so if you are um, talking about people who survived the Khmer Rouge or um, Rwanda, they, they're coming out of a very different cultural context and the idea of speaking may have different meanings and there isn't, um, or scripts. Um, uh, I, I think the, this cultural, spe cultural specificity, and this is where I'm talking about these different losses touching and, um, and, I, and how I would apply Rothberg here and multi-directional mummy, and then we'll come back to, to implication, which is to say how are, these, these other genocides similar to and different from. And I think we need to keep in mind the similar to and the different. It's not making them one and the same, but by illuminating one, we get a sense of something else. So in my book, I talk about ordinary losses in American Jewish life. Um, my father grew, grew up in the 1930s in the depression in the United States to immigrant parents. His mother died when he was nine years old. And he had another mother and he never talked about this. Um, and I used uh, Holocaust, because the Holocaust has taught us so much about memory and trauma. I, I used formal connections between um, a work of Holocaust uh, artistic commemoration, a film called Half Sister, which is about um, a photograph of a half sister who died in the Holocaust. And that's the only image he had, a, a film that's trying to an, reanimate her by telling, by, by juxtaposing enough film, even though she has a, a single image. And a, a postmark picture of my own, which was really one of the first images I ever saw of my father's um, first mother, though uh, my biological grandmother, because I knew another person and, and I didn't know this other woman existed and I'm named after her. Um, and it was only through, I was in my, I was 22 when I first saw an image of her. And so, I wanted to think about similar to and different from each other. So I wanna be very careful about that. Going back to implication, I think that 
people want to say, are you a bystander? Are you a perpetrator or are you a victim? And I think that implication allows us to think about the complexity of our positions, right? The kind of um, multiple shifting or um, some of the ways in which we think about intersectionality in its most robust forms, that we have all these different positions and it depends on where we are at any given moment. And, and to be able to, 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 to think about the relative claims that we make, that it's not you're this or you're that, and I think the implication um, helps us also think about the haunted landscapes in which we um, live our lives. Um, you know, the, 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 the terrain in uh, the mid-Atlantic region of the United States where I live, where native peoples were, um, uh, you know, were, were, were dispossessed, um, where <clears throat> enslaved people were working the land. Um, and I'm living on those mounds or <clears throat> being at Polin today or going to Umschlatzplatz, you know, we're on soil that has all of these resonances and trying to think about how are we implicated? Um, and it's not to say we're bad or we're good, but to just recognize the complexity of carrying these legacies forward. I hope that helps some. Definitely so, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. And now, uh, Agnieszka, uh, go ahead. Um, well, let me start by saying yeah, thank you, Laura. This was a wonderful talk. And uh, uh, it's not really a question. It's a, it's a kind of an answer to a question you asked a couple of um, couple of minutes ago. You were asking about this, let's say, changing attitudes towards memory work in Poland. Um, and I was thinking about one example that I, I have come across in my own research. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, I'm kind of interested in trees in Poland and the kind of history, um, let's say, behind them, in them with them. And uh, one of the kind of interesting um, things I've noticed is this kind of fraught history of trees in um, exed camps. Um, you know, what to do with trees that are, you know, 70, 80 years old and are dying or are sickly. And um, for instance, in Auschwitz, up until mid 90s, um, old trees, ones that kind of remember the Holocaust were kind of cut out and they were replanted with new trees. But in 1994, the decision was changed, right? And decided that the, the old trees, the ones that are the ones that are dying or that are sickly are going to be kind of left alone and they, they will be kind of cut to the, let's say, not cut out, but cut so that they are not um, kind of endangering anyone, but they will still be there for like, let's say memory work, right? A kind of non-human, let's say non um type of memory work that they are a kind of, you know, part of. Um, and from mid nineties, they are no longer kind of removed from the, from, from the, um, uh, from the site. And I, and I found this interesting, right? And um, when you kind of look at the history of, of, of Auschwitz and how, let's say, um, ecological concerns have been intertwined with memory work. I mean, this is a, this is a fascinating subject. Um, in the 60s, um, part of a very famous architectural Polish duo, Oskar Hansen, um, had an idea to kind of form um, a kind of belt, a kind of diagonal belt um, with kind of made with concrete that would kind of cut through the whole uh, camp and then the camp would be kind of, and everything would be kind of left to nature. So nothing would be kind of built there, nothing would be pre kind of preserved. There would be only just this kind of one long piece of kind of, you know, concrete going through the um, for the camp and then the nature would take over. And this was met with a huge, um, kind of you know protest in the in the 60s like both the you know the, the survivors and uh and kind of people kind of you know concerned with memory politics and plans that like no no um that's not really possible right you cannot kind of leave the the camp to nature you cannot kind of give it back in a sense um but for instance today you know when you think about ecology kind of ecological concerns you know building a, a concrete uh, belt throughout the camp would also be kind of you know we would also kill off quite a lot of you know trees and and insects and you know flora fauna whatever right so this a, would be a kind of violation oh. yes yes of, of a different sorts of course but in order to commemorate people so this is a kind of you know when you look at the history of trees of you know of kind of you know fauna and flora in, in, in camps it's also kind of interesting how sometimes they are positioned as witnesses 
sometimes they're positioned as uh, co-survivors in a sense, especially since a lot of the ashes were actually um, kind of, kind of, you know, used to fertilize them, right? So this is uh, this is something that I found interesting, and I don't really have any question here. It's just something that I remembered, and I thought that, you know, this is a kind of good example of how. Um, how memory work changes in Poland and sometimes in very kind of unexpected places uh, with objects, if I can call trees objects, or let's, let's kind of call them for for the kind of sake of simplicity, right? That um, there is something here. And um, I remember reading that, you know, two years ago, I think in, in another uh, ex camp, I think it was in Płaszów, um, they, they also kind of wanted to cut out the trees because of building a monument or something and they wanted to cut out like 250 trees or something i think they did finally and i remember that reading an article that um people in the community they they were very angry about this but not because of the again not because of the memory work but because of the kind of let's say typically human concerns like they need the trees because it's better if, for i'm not sure if it's me or you or yeah uh yeah it might be my internet connection yeah so okay okay you know i will maybe leave it at this i can kind of share links um maybe later but i just wanted to kind of add this to the discussion about the kind of object yeah. of memory which are sometimes used perhaps even abused as kind of co-witnesses or um co-survivors so i just kind of wanted to kind of throw that in but and, and thank you again for a wonderful lecture no, and thank you, because I, I, I was at Pauline and it begins with those trees and I was saying, I, I know I just talked to somebody about trees and I was thinking about that. Um, I thought about you when I was walking into the exhibit. Um, I, I think that the tensions about should 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 these places of um, of horror um, be um, preserved right or. Um, or should we allow them to become ruins. Right. And and there there is all I think there's just ambivalence around, you know, because there, there's no one right answer here. Right. Um, and I'm thinking about how precious I write about the shoes that come uh, from Medinic to the Holocaust Museum. And I talked to you guys a little bit about it yesterday. But but but, you know, they have to use fine arts couriers to, to package them and send them. It's it's a fortune. Right. And they're sitting at Medinic, you know, and the, you know, they're not, they're not particularly well pr protected, right? But they're spending, you know, huge amounts of money to do this back and forth every five years because they can't get a long-term loan because EU regulations changed over the course of the opening of the museum where they had long-term loans or they had to give back one of the, um, there, there was a, a bunker that, uh, that was in the, the museum, um, a barrack, and, uh, and they had to return that to Poland because the, the thing was up. And then they had to buy another one and retrofit it, right, um, to fit into the museum in Washington. So proximity also um, uh, has it shifts what, what matters or, or how preciously things are, 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 are cared for. And at the museum in Washington, the curators and conservators were telling me that when they started you know, get amassing all of these artifacts, these authentic artifacts, you know, they were also responding to Holocaust denial in the United States, right? That's they wanted a museum that was gonna be filled with lots of really real things. Um, and so um, in, in part, the museum itself created a market, right? They created value for things that may not have been valued before changing memory. Um, so, you know, when they when they put all their shoes in these tubs and 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 polish them and they, it, which made them much worse, right? That was an effort in the in the '60s, and yet it, and it's it's been awful for the you know kind of retention of the the preserving of these shoes. Um, and now you know the preciousness. Every shoe is in its own bag, and it has to be uh, temperature controlled. And the reason why you have to use the fine arts couriers is because God forbid. Um, you get condensation, right? So, so they can go across borders um, without opening the packages, right? And meanwhile, they have to insure this stuff. So how much are they worth, right? Um, they're both priceless, literally, and, you know, worthless and, you know, without measure, right? It's both things. And I think that this is the kind of ambivalence about the trees, I think is kind of telling, right? That, 
you, you want to keep them there. And I know like in the United States, there are these quote historic trees that actually probably aren't really the historic trees, but they have a mythology about them. And um, in Philadelphia, for example, the, the Quakers have the tree on the, this at, at Haverford College's campus. And they tell the story about it. And, you know, the scholars who work on this were like, you know, this isn't really historically accurate. Um, but they would do things like take cuttings from the tree so that they could regenerate the same tree. Um, so again, I think there's a lot of um, investment. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I just want to kind of point to the ambivalences because I think that that's kind of where we live. Um, and as much as I want there to be like a right way to do this because I'm so overwhelmed, um, part of what we've learned is that there aren't. And, and of course, look at how the memory work at camps have changed over time and what narratives are brought to those places and do what kind of work. Um, so I think, and your architectural example was a really good one. Like, okay, this is the, what was ecological point is kind of horrifying in a different, in a different historical moment to have all that concrete, right? And they're just these really um, shifting um, ways of, of thinking about the past in an ever-changing present. And that's, and that's how we're gonna keep memory alive is by having these discussions, these arguments, these different reception histories and talking to each other and engaging with each other and making work, works of scholarship, works of art, works of, um, uh, of, of other kinds of imagination. I think all of that is fruitful. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Laura, for today. And I wish you all a wonderful sunny afternoon and evening. Bye.